Welcome to Mysteries of Superstition Mountain. I'm Larry Hedrick, where we bring the past into the present for our future viewers. Today, we have another great story by Hank Sheffer. So who the heck is this guy, Ludwig Grath Rosencrantz? And why do I feel like I'm supposed to know something about him? Well, first off, everyone out here around the superstition area knew him as Doc. They just knew him as Doc. He was another one of those ones who was interested in gold, and he searched for the precious, if not elusive, metal all over California. But ultimately, he wound up in Arizona over at Mojave Desert up near Bradshaw in 1946. He was convinced that he could find the lost peg leg mine. It wasn't until a short while later that he moved down to the Superstition Mountain area, and this is where he became known as the Sage of the Superstition Mountains. If that mine, the Lost Peg Leg, sounds familiar, it should. You may have seen our whole video devoted to Adolf Ruth. That search had led him into getting hurt very badly over in California, and he wound up with a crippled leg that followed him until the day of his death, which incidentally happened right here in the Superstition Mountains in 1930. Now let's have a look at where Doc Rosencrantz came from. He was quite an interesting fellow. Ludwig G. Rosencrantz was born in Lotta, Washington. His father was a Veterans Administration doctor and was constantly on the move. And for young Doc, uh, he Americanized his name from Rosencrantz to Rosencrantz to make life a little easier for him in those days. Rosencrantz remembered living on a Hoopa Indian Reservation. And growing up, he also lived at Fort McHenry in Baltimore, Maryland. Then he was off to Chicago and finally Memphis, Tennessee. He definitely did get around. Now, he attended the uh, Southern College over in Memphis for a while, but he decided that college wasn't his cup of tea. So he moved on from there, and he moved to California in 1935, where he planned to strike it rich. That was his ultimate goal. That's what he was going to do. He was going to strike it rich. But now, while in California, he also took a turn at Hollywood. He played the part of a burgundy soldier in a film called If I Were King. The film starred Ronald Coleman and Francis D. and was released in 1938. Doc said, I didn't hit Hollywood by storm. As a matter of fact, Hollywood actually hit me by storm. I was in, and just that quick, I was out. After that, Doc became acquainted with billiards. He moved on down into LA and became quite a uh, hustler in a pool hall down there. In fact, it was located at 6th and Union Streets, and he became known as the 6th and Union Street Doc. He was that good a shooter. And then came December 7, 1941. Doc remembered that date pretty well from the pool hall. He had no money, and he was just stone cold broke. Well, now, we are learning that Doc was a pretty diversified young fella. We learned that, and that happened to him very early on. It is now March of 1942. It hadn't taken long before Doc found himself drafted into the United States Army Air Corps. There was no Air Force at the time. That didn't happen until after the war in 1948. His basic training took place at Shepherd Field in Texas. He then went to radio school at Barksville Field in Louisiana. From radio school, he was assigned to the 17th Bomber Group. And for those of you who know your history, that was General Jimmy Doolittle's group. And Rosencrantz was assigned to him as a radioman. A short while later, Doc was reassigned as a writer to the Army Public Relations Department. He wrote for the Stars and Stripes. While in the military public relations job during World War II, Doc sent many interviews of enlisted men and, and the officers to their hometown newspapers all across the country. 
And as a public information writer, he also toured the Austrian concentration camps of Mauthausen-Gießen. He told the stories of Hitler's Nazi party and their atrocities against humanity. His vivid descriptions of those horrible death camps were printed in newspapers all across the United States. Doc carried the horrors of what he saw in those camps with him for the rest of his life. It soured him on the human race and is probably what caused him to retreat from society altogether. Now, after three years, Doc Rosencrantz was discharged from the United States Army at Camp Atterbury in Indiana. After a brief visit with his family, he then returned to California. So now we know something about the early years of this man. As mentioned earlier, Doc always believed very strongly that he could find the lost Peg Leg Mine. He also believed equally strongly that he would need a dirigible to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't have any dirigibles here in Arizona. He even spoke with a dirigible captain about his scheme. The captain politely told him to give it up, and this is when he decided to stay in Arizona. Doc finally settled into a cabin he built along the Apache Trail about seven miles northeast of Apache Junction. This location was the claim owned by a Mrs. Cena Lewis. It was her insistence that Doc build his cabin and filed the lazy dot claim in his own name. I have found no information further than that about Mrs. Cena Lewis. She was no relation, as near as we can tell, to the Lewises, the Beatrice and Alfred Lewis of the Bulldog Mine family. Once settled in his cabin along the Apache Trail, he turned to prospecting and writing. His first small book was titled Spanish Gold and the Lost Dutchman Mine. The first edition was published in 1949. The second, the second edition was published in 1953. His book so enraged a pious contemporary lost Dutchman expert, Barry Storm, that Storm sued Doc for copyright infringement. The lawsuit was a bunch of hooey. It was a bunch of crap, but it served its purpose. Unfortunately, Doc was discouraged from ever publishing another work of his. It's kind of ironic that the, the story, The Lust for Gold movie, was based on Barry Storm's book, and it came out in 1949. Of course, that couldn't have anything to do with nothing, I guess. I don't know. However, that is not to say that uh, Doc did not continue to write. But not all of his writing was about gold or treasure or that sort of thing. His personal notebooks were filled with quips, witticisms, and satirical statements, more about life and death and such than anything else. Rosencrantz's last manuscript was titled The Kingdom of Reality. It was written, but never published. It described life itself and what he believed eventually happened to the soul it was so very complicated and analytical, and it attempted to explain the unknowns about the philosophical being of the author himself and the impact that his war years experiences had placed on him. And now, as if all that wasn't enough for one man's go round, there was yet another interesting turn of events that Doc tried to get in on. This time might finally just turn out to be the very one that would put those riches he had dreamed about for so long within his reach. Realistically, he never had a chance. Because of those deep-rooted philosophies of his, the James Kidd estate case looked like it might just be the ticket he was looking for. The whole episode turned out to be pretty complicated, if not just plain convoluted. Here's what that story was all about. James Kidd was a copper prospector who literally disappeared in the superstitions in 1949. He was never found. 
As fate would have it, he wasn't even officially declared dead until 18 years later in 1956. Or maybe it was as the superstitions would have it. Rumors continued to circulate that the old man was still alive. Of course, kids' remaining family wanted no parts of that. There was way too much money involved. So the case, of course, just like today, went to trial at the Superior Court in Arizona. Judge Robert L. Myers received more than 150 petitions from various spiritual organizations declaring they were the best fit to fulfill kids' wishes. The media had a field day, of course. It labeled the trial the, the soul trial, or at times the ghost trial of the century. Well, Judge Myers finally awarded the money to the Barrow Neurological Institute of Phoenix. Unfortunately for them, on appeal, a higher court granted the money to the American Society of Physical Research. The money was used to investigate deathbed visions or near-death experiences. All in all, the court case had taken up a total of 26 years to complete. So what was it in that will that got Doc Grosenkrantz so excited? Here is how it actually read and why it caused so much hoopla. Now I'm gonna read this for you word for word because the old man didn't write things quite right all the time. He wrote, this is my first and only will and is dated the 2nd of January, 1946. I have no heirs and I have not married in my life. And after all my funeral expenses have been paid and a hundred dollars given to some preacher of the gospel to say farewell at my grave, sell all my property, which is all in cash and stocks with E.F. Hutton and Company over here in Phoenix. Some in a safety deposit box and have this balance money go into research or some scientific proof of a soul of the human body which leaves after death. I think in time there can be a photograph of a soul leaving the human at death. And it was signed James Kidd, Will and Testament. Well, now several things came to light. The estate that was supposedly worth a half a million dollars was actually only worth $270,000. And nobody got any pictures. There was no film at 11, as they say. There's a bummer. The James Kidd venture had proved to be a lost cause for Doc, just like everything else. But that is not to say that he never went and searched for real earthly treasure. Over the years, he did make numerous trips into the mountains. He spent time on Blacktop Mesa, Lewis Ridge, and East Boulder Canyon in search for the lost Dutchman mine. Time and again, he was denied his ultimate quest. He never found anything. Doc's old shack had a certain amount of nostalgia and magnetism about it, and it just seemed to attract people from everywhere. And make no mistake, Doc always had to welcome Matt out. Of course, there was that little secret that he had, under the floorboards, under the mat by the front door, there were two rattlesnakes, and they would buzz every time he'd stomp his foot on that mat. Now, that's a bit of a heart starter, I'd say, especially if you didn't know they were there. But even so, it didn't keep people away. Visitors and friends came to sit in his old shack to talk about the lost Dutchman mine, the superstitions, politics, religion, or their own ideas about life in general. People making their way to Doc's cabin included everybody from movie stars, Olympians, politicians, musicians, school teachers, police officers, and members of the worldwide press. The man had an amazing talent for wit that often dazzled everybody who was in his presence. That is what gained him the moniker, Sage of the Superstitions. Well, now my story is just about run its course. Ludwig Doc Rosencrantz is gone. 
He passed away on April 7th in 1986 in the Phoenix Veterans Hospital. He was buried with full military honors. The chances of another one like him showing up anytime soon are pretty much slim to none, especially here at the Superstitions. Now, every once in a while, the, the folks over at Falcon Field put aircraft in the air from a bygone era. Whenever I hear the war of B-25 echoing off the soups, it brings to mind old Doc Rosencrantz. In the final estimation, perhaps the treasure Doc so desperately sought was never meant to be in the form of treasure or golden riches. He may have been a lot richer than even he thought possible without ever even realizing it. No matter how Doc may have looked at it, today for us, it's just another one of those mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.